Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Gordon Oaks Red Bear Student Center. My name is uh, Candace Waskis Lafferty, and I'm the Senior Director of Indigenous Engagement here on campus. And I actually have the pleasure of working in this beautiful building day in and day out. Um, I'm actually so proud to be able to come up and just give some opening remarks, and, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land and talk a little bit about that. But I want to say a special thanks to uh, Dr. Waldrum and his team. They constantly come back to this place because they understand the significance of doing things well, doing things grounded from Indigenous perspective. And I can't think of a more natural department on campus when it comes to reconciliation, of reconciling the land and the relationships amongst that land through anthropology uh, to come and do that kind of work here. So officially I'm here to not just welcome you, but um, it's become part of university custom for a very strong reason to recognize and reaffirm our relationships. So I do, as we do gather here on Treaty 6 territory and a homeland of the Métis, we repay our respects to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with another. So we say these things to not only give context, but to talk about relationship moving forward, not just what's happened in the past. Today's discussion uh, is something I'm very much looking forward to. I look, I look out to the crowd, I see Dr. Westman, I see Dr. Walker, and I think about our relationship with Wanuskewin Heritage Park. I, I no longer speak on behalf of the park, but I've had a 10-year relationship with that organization and the strong connection that we have with this university. The, uh, the, this discipline of, of archaeology and anthropology has come out and made some very strong statements about the role that their discipline has played in, in uh, the history in the capture and the data of Indigenous people and how proactively they're working forward. So I welcome you all today. I welcome the students and I welcome the faculty that are here. I, I welcome whoever is looking through that camera. Hello. And um, I, I wish you the best of days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Candice, and thank you very much for that warm welcome to uh, an absolutely beautiful uh, facility here. My name is Jim Waldrum, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. And just as a little side note before we get going here today, uh, in, in November in Vancouver, uh, it was one of the largest meetings of anthropologists ever. The uh, uh, US-based American Anthropological Society joined with the Canadian Anthropological Society uh, at, for um, this mega conference. And the keynote was delivered by uh, Douglas Cardinal. And, and uh, Mr. Cardinal was asked to select three features of his architectural career that he could use to, to sort of highlight his understanding of an indigenous perspective on archaeology. And you'll be absolutely thrilled to know that this Gordon Oaks Red Bear Center was one of the three that he chose to present to thousands of scholars from all around the world. So I think that's just absolutely fabulous. <laughs> So we're very fortunate to be able to meet here, and thank you for welcoming us again, uh, Candace, into this beautiful, beautiful center. So, um, so uh, I, first of all, I'm going to uh, introduce the panelists and then give you a bit of a, for, uh, a sense of the format. Um, so uh, the far end, okay, I'll go from left to right. We have Honey Constant. Honey is Plains Cree from the Sturgeon Lake uh, First Nation, uh, and she's an archaeology graduate student working under uh, Dr. Ernie Walker, uh, and she's also a fixture at Wena Skewen, and uh, many, of you will, many of you will have encountered her there, and she's also just... Uh, everywhere, it seems, doing all kinds of things for us, and we very much appreciate having her in our program. Okay. Uh, next to her is Jessica Genru, and Jessica is an assistant curator and librarian with a focus on material culture at the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center, and she's come across to join us. Uh, she has to leave a little bit earlier today because of parental responsibilities, but most of us understand how that works, so thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, next is Dr. Susan Rowley, for those of you uh, who did not uh, uh, make it to the presentation yesterday. Uh, Dr. Rowley is um, a curator of public archaeology at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia and uh, a specialist in issues of cultural repatriation uh, in First Nations context. So thank you for being with us. And finally, uh, Dr. Terry Clark is, of course, a member of the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, Northwest Coast archaeologist, who also has a, um, a great interest in working in community-based archaeology and issues of repatriation. So what we've decided to do today is I, I generated a set of questions, which will probably very quickly go out the window once the discussion starts. 
um, but I felt I wouldn't be doing my responsibilities uh, if, if I didn't. So um, we're going to open up with uh, uh, the first question, and then I uh, will moderate the discussion uh, as, as seems appropriate, uh, and hopefully we'll get a nice conversation going amongst the panelists. Uh, eventually, um, you will be invited to also participate. Uh, we're going to play a little bit with the, with, um, the format, uh, simply because Jessica does have to leave early, so we want to make sure that if there are any comments or questions specifically to some of the things that Jessica may raise on behalf of the Cultural Centre, uh, that you have an opportunity to engage with her before she has to, has to leave. But we will continue on after uh, she leaves, which will be around 3.15 or so. Okay, so. The opening question I gave everybody was as follows. Is the repatriation of tangible cultural heritage important for reconciliation? All right. So um, we're going to give Jessica the, the, the opening comments uh, and take it away. All right. So to um, just sort of backtrack, um, a lot of people don't know about the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Centre. We've been around for around 50 years. Um, the the um, cultural center started off with a group of, of um, men that were um, a part of the residential schooling system, and they found this need to um, preserve um, preserve the indigenous voice and the indigenous identity in a time of crisis, um, and. The way I look at, at um, Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Centre is we've been repatriating for 50 years. Um, and what I mean by that is we've been preserving, promoting, and um, protecting our cultural way for those 50 years already. Um, it's in the way we are governed. It's in the way that we make decisions every day. It's in the way that we build teams within the organization and how we approach the needs of the First Nations communities, the 74 First Nations communities in Saskatchewan, um, and how we build partnerships with tribal councils. I don't know if this is on. Um, so that's how I see my, um, my workplace. Um, I stepped into the SICC being asked to take care of the collections, and our collections are comprised of oral history, um, there's about 564 um, recordings in most the languages and the art, the artifacts, the art and the um, very sacred uh, collection that's not available to public but that is taken care of in a different way. Um, when I approached it, that was my first thought is like we've already been doing this work for 50 years and I picked it up and what, can, what else can we do to maintain this? And how do we create and how do we make this accessible to, accessible to our First Nations children and our families? Because um, I come from an academic perspective. I've been in university since I was 18 years old. I've been programmed to think like an academic, um, but my heart is not an academic. My heart is with um, ceremonies. And it's kind of funny that I'm here in the uh, Gordon Oaks Red Bear Center. Is Gordon? Elder, late Elder Gordon Oaks is my ceremonial father. Um, he named me when I was a child and guided me through ceremonies until he passed away. Um, and that's, that's, where our, that's the perspective and the approach that I take every day in the work that I do. And when people ask about reconciliation and um, approach us with reconciliation, I always, I approach it from my heart space, my wowakan, it's what they say is like your, your blood energy. And those decisions and how you speak and how you, um, how you build teams and how you partner with people, um, they come from that, those teachings that I, was that I was very lucky to receive when I was a kid. And not a lot of kids receive that, and they still don't. And that's what we're working really hard on, bringing that back so we can save our children and our future generations. Um, in terms of repatriation, um, the way that I approach it is that we, at SICC, we do have a repatriation policy. It's pretty much bare bones right now. Um, it's just been developed in the past two years. Um, and we have not really ironed out the procedures to the policy because we are going case by case, we're going day by day, we're going community by community. 
and um, we're not approaching it in a way where we need to develop procedures to these policies and we need to you know thicken up our policies we're approaching it um, through the way of the pipe and the sweetgrass and um, that's always been the way SICCs operate and I think that's the strength of SICC it's always been rooted in the um, the pipe being known as our constitution that's our guidance that's our way that we do everything and that repatriation is 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 guided through the pipe and through the medicines and through the ceremonies and that's that's what we represent at SICC and what we're trying to bring back and what we're trying to save um, and we really you know working with uh, various organizations and institutions on um, friendship so that we can we can build a stronger uh, repatriation process and experiences in Saskatchewan. Um, so how we approach it with, with my experience in the past, I've only been there for about four years, um, is we talk to, we talk we talk about and to um, the, the ceremonial objects, the sacred objects, as if they're our relatives. So oftentimes we, um, we refer to um, like all my relations in the different languages with the different nations that we work with on building those repatriation experiences with those different nations. So example, for example, we are starting a repatriation policy with Pachinac in, and the community is utilizing the term salotine, which is that's my, that's my relative. And that's how we begin talking about their objects that we are working with on preserving and promoting and protecting with them. And um, what that means for them, um, there's a lot of emotions involved. There's a, there's a, there's a, a need to trust. There's a need to heal. There's a lot of really hard um, emotions that are involved, and that's why we always include and incorporate ceremony and spiritual um, spirituality into what we do, um, because we look at everything has a spirit, everything has energy, everything has a walk on, like a, ener a blood energy to it, and those connections cannot be broken. Um, and repatriating those, repatriating those back to the community empowers the community to become spiritually stronger and to continue healing from the um, um, intergenerational trauma that has caused a lot of problems, and we could talk about that for days and days. Um, but that's, that's the perspective that um, SICC approaches repatriation and the, rep the reconciliation process as well. So... Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, so Tanse, Miyoki Sagao Nidotamak. I can actually talk very loud, so I don't know if I need the mic at all. But, um, oh, perfect, then I'll, I'll, I'll be closer. Um, so I, I totally agree, being an Indigenous archaeologist, that uh, repatriation of tangible material culture should be definitely a priority. And like going off of your remarks, everything you were saying, I'm like, yes, yes. Um, and it's crazy, before we actually started talking, we were just discussing how we knew each other. And I actually have your phone number in the back of my phone. What? Yeah. Don't call me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know you, but how? We yeah. actually had a very good conversation on um, Wanna Skate One stuff, so. Okay, yeah. There we go. Yeah. yeah. And it's crazy. Um, and a lot of the things that I do, the word will go to win. If you guys heard me talk about this, it's all my relations, it's the connection, it's the teaching that we know that everything is connected and everything is supposed to happen for a reason. So our paths crossed like three months ago, yeah. and then here we are again. Um, so when we talk about tangible artifacts, it's more than just the physical artifact. We know that <coughs> um, there's stories in place, and as Indigenous people, we're oral traditions people. We, we tell stories, and it's those stories that give us meaning, knowing our past. So repatriation of artifacts is more than just the actual physical artifact. It's returning our stories and knowing who we are and where we came from. So I guess that's a little brief. Susan, I'll put this away. Good afternoon, everyone.
everybody. Um, my name is Sue Rowley. As you heard, um, it's really wonderful to, uh, to return to Treaty 6 lands and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, I work at the University of British Columbia, which is located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Hunkamenum speaking uh, Musqueam people. And I want to, at this point, acknowledge their generosity uh, in uh, helping me when I first moved out to the West Coast to learn more about who they are and their teachings and where they come from. Um, and one of the things that they always talk about and I think is really critical for, for repatriation is for every project, every new venture, you should go in with an open heart and an open mind and just be prepared to think about the way that things are and that you're going to encounter different ways of knowing and different ways of being. Um, and so when we talk about the I, I really loved, <clears throat> excuse me, I really loved what both of you were saying, and this, this real sense that while um, some of the international bodies have tried to separate the tangible from the intangible, that you can't actually do that, that the physical tangible object may, contains the intangible, it brings back so much to communities uh, when those come home, the, the immediacy of the response, the reaction, um, even when, well, well also, when we're looking at work of language reclamation, the way that the tangible brings the language back, it pours out of people. We've seen this with basketry work, where, where someone will say, I don't know those words, and then they'll handle the basket, and the, the language will start to, to come back to them. So when working with, with communities on the coast, uh, one of the additional kinds of things, that the, the relationships, the, the living beings, the entities that these um, belongings um, and treasures represent. Uh, we also hear a lot of language about respect. So the Haida, for example, refer to the work that they do in repatriation as yagudangan, the concept of to pay respect. And another one of the communities that we work with in repatriation talks about this is their responsibility. They have to take care of everything that belongs to them and that by, they, by them being in a colonial institution such as a museum, that has taken away their power, their authority, and their control, and their responsibility to look after their heritage. So uh, that's my answer to your first question. Thank you. Thierry. Slide this over. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, so a lot of my work um, parallels with repatriation. Uh, first, as a curator of Western Canadian archaeology at the Canadian Museum of History, it was actually uh, my responsibility. Uh, I was in advising uh, the federal government on how to deal with um, repatriation cases in Western Canada. And so, uh, as we know, uh, the lack of treaty, um, many treaties in, in Western Canada meant that the bulk of the cases that we dealt with um, in terms of uh, repatriation were cases uh, that were from Western Canada and, and that I had to look at. Um, my other work uh, with the Shishal Nation in British Columbia um, deals a lot with the concept of repatriation. It's in a different sense in that um, they have their own repository. And so stuff may come here, uh, or when I worked at the museum or other places, the University of Toronto, but it was never ours. That had already been negotiated. We were never going to own the objects. They always belonged to the nation, and they were always going to be returned. We had borrowed them for a brief window to look at them, to analyze them, uh, to take our pictures, whatever we needed to do. Uh, but they belonged uh, in seashells, and they get returned. They have their own museum, their own repository. And uh, that certainly may be a model uh, for some nations moving forward where they have control of their heritage um, from the beginning to the end, and they never lose contact, and we don't have to deal with uh, issues of repatriation in the future. We obviously have tons of universities and museums uh, that have extant collections, and um, one of the biggest problems uh, that with returning um, tangible heritage is figuring out where it should go. Um, a lot of the stuff um, was collected uh, a very long time ago, as we've talked about last year. Um, anthropology and archaeology, these are disciplines of colonialism. They were created during the colonial period, and the museums, the major museums around the world, um, benefited from this. this. These are the collections were collected um, from vulnerable groups everywhere, uh, and sometimes with not great records. And so 
Some cases are going to be very easy, and we know exactly who to return to, the family and the group. In other cases, we're going to have to do a lot of work to figure that out. It's a daunting task, but I think we're up to the challenge. Thank you very much, Terry. So that, that, uh, that provides a nice uh, segue into the, the second, uh, second question that I had presented to the panelists. Um, and that is, uh, what are some of the uh, pragmatic issues that have to be addressed in order to engage in a process of repatriation? Um, and recognizing that museums and universities uh, as uh, heavily bureaucratic institutions um, may have to approach the topic somewhat differently than the way communities uh, might um, uh, approach it, or organizations such as the uh, Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center. So I'd like to see our conversation now shift into uh, um, a discussion of the actual real issues that, that uh, we face in engaging in processes of repatriation. Uh, and, um, and call on the panelists perhaps even to, to share with us any um, experiences they have or that they know of uh, which would highlight some of what these, these issues might be. So, now anyone, we'll open it up now. Anyone can jump in at any time at this point. So just, I'm just speaking from experience. Um, one issue that I've, I've seen with, but it's, it's been a, a trend in working in the reference and information world and um, collaborating between different types of collections like archives, library, and museum collections, which is what, it's a mixed collection as, as I see, it's not just checking in books and cataloging and that, um, maintaining, a, maintaining the collection, it's, um, there's, there's um from my experience in the in the dealing with universities and communities that there's a huge divide there and i th i think we've there's been a lot of really good work um that has been done there but there is still a, a lot of fear of the um there's still a lot of fear there i can i could i've experienced it a few times where um there's been disagreements between the scientific way of doing things and the spiritual way of doing things. And those disagreements are um, still, they're still, of it, they're still happening today. And when we're dealing with repatri repatriating ancestral remains, remains, we often come head to head with um, institutions on that, on our way of doing things and their way of doing things and what's important to them might not be important to us, and what's important to them, they don't understand, or they're just not on that same, I, they just don't see that perspective. So I think that's an important issue that still needs to be hashed out between communities, the people that this, that this belongs to, the land that it belongs to, and then the, the the study of the objects and the the um, the home it's going to take, or the the information that needs to be extracted from it. So that's just one I one experience that I had so far, and it's that's about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, and I would I would totally agree with that that there are these divides and that that it's it's a it's a something that requires a lot of discussion and conversation, and that it's always about uh, for institutions that are beginning work with communities to develop and establish relationships of trust so that they can start to have those really challenging conversations. For example, with the, re with the return of ancestral remains, is there any work that the community wants done? Do they want to know if an individual who is being returned is what gender they are? what biological gender they are. Does that have a difference to how that person might be reburied? For some indigenous communities, it does. So they may want to engage with that. Others may say no, none. So it's that sense, and it's taking on the United Nations Declaration of, of uh, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with the right to control and saying, yes, that's not our right as an, as an institution to say you have to do this. It's up to you, the community, to make that determination and us to help you to do any work that you need 
to have done. I think another um, really pragmatic issue that we run into all the time is messy data. People think that museums um, are authoritative, that we know everything about everything that are in our collections. In fact, we have really lousy data on a lot of things. Um, and things have also been misattributed. So, uh, for instance, uh, on the West Coast, there are entire nations whose heritage was actually cataloged as others. So the Heltzik were qu quite often their heritage was classified as Kwa 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 or the Heisla as uh, Tsimsian. So in museum collections, you have this problem of materials that are, were completely misclassified by people who didn't know. And that's some of the really, that's again that challenging work that we need to do to uh, help with that kind of work, and that's on us to, to, to do that kind of work and work with communities uh, on bringing that. So that's just one other area of, of uh, pragmatic issues and overlapping claims for us in British Columbia is a, is a huge other issue. Um, yeah. I just wanted to agree with her on that. We, SICC recently hosted a gathering on Indigenous collections called the Imich Manaya Kick. And that mean, that that in Cree means we need to take care of them, mm -hmm. our ancestors, because our ancestors. If we take care of our ancestors, we, they'll take care of us. So there's like a spiritual agreement there, and we um, have to relearn those because that process of relearning the taking care of the ancestors is also incorporates a lot of what was lost and stolen over the years. Um, so at the gathering, they, there was a huge consensus with the speakers that um, collections across Canada or even just Turtle Island that there's the provenance to items and objects and stories, there's, just the, there's a lot of missing pieces to what we know to, the, the, to indigenous objects and indigenous collections. So I think that that missing piece is, um, is um, that disconnect to the, the people that it belongs to, to the families, to the person, to the communities. And that's, that's where we need, that's what we have to focus on and work with next, is that community-led research and collaboration. I, I agree with these points. Um, and when we're talking about the repatriation, especially of human remains, uh, these are probably the biggest problems. Um, that uh, we may know where they were dug up, um, maybe 100 years ago, uh, maybe less, but um, for us to give them back to a community, we need to know which community it is. Um, and so that can be really problematic. As we know, there are overlapping uh, territories uh, all through the country. Uh, many groups used uh, different uh, areas at different times of the year, or uh, they changed uh, throughout you know, the centuries of, of where they lived. And so um, it's a lot easier if all of the groups have similar uh, burial traditions, and so if you're going to give it back, and there's five groups, and they all agree that, that the remains should be reburied here or cremated here, and have a ceremony um, that they all agree with, then that's uh, a lot easier to deal with. But if there are any disagreements, then it becomes more problematic. You don't want to give it to a group that um, will cremate when the other groups want to rebury, and so uh, you have to be really cautious. And that's why there's so much research that needs to be done. Uh, it's not a matter of just giving stuff back. You have to give it back correctly in the right way to the right people under the right circumstances. And um, I think we're, we're all trying to work towards figuring that out, telling the life history of the people, but also of the objects so that they can go back to where they belong. Honey, is there anyone to add here? We have a question already. Yes. Um, you can just speak from there. Yeah.
I'm not sure what uh, what would you propose. Maybe a moment of silence or yes. something like that? Would that? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Make sense. Why don't we, I'll ask everybody to, to, to rise and we'll just we'll take a moment to reflect on, on the comments that you've just heard uh, and particularly the issues of, of the grief um, that uh, is engendered by um, the removal of, of items of, of significance to people's uh, and, and housed in, in museums and, of course, um, some of these issues that we'll have to deal with in trying to right uh, this wrong. So please join me. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. I think that uh, uh, that aspect of the issue of repatriation is absolutely crucial, and uh, um, because these are these are not just objects that we're dealing with here. We're we're dealing with stories. We're dealing with memories. We're we're dealing with heritage, and heritage is very important to people. Um, I think the conversation that we're having here, and as far as I know, there has not been such a conversation on the university campus in, in any meaningful way. Um, and we're, we're somewhat inspired by the event that the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center put on last year as well, is to make sure that we begin to have these, these conversations and, and talk about what these issues are so that we can begin to, to, to right this wrong in, in our, our, I guess in our, our somewhat smallish way uh, as, a, as a, small, uh, a small campus, um, but is uh, um, uh, an institution that is tied to a legacy of colonialism. Uh, and that's why I opened with the question of uh, um, the, the way we might tie repatriation to issues of reconciliation because I think um, everyone would agree that uh, this is one of the many wrongs that needs to be uh, reflected upon and, and righted. Um, and as our panelists are suggesting here, um, uh, it's a complex process and we don't want to, we don't want to um, build upon one historic wrong today by doing this in the wrong way, doing it in a disrespectful way. Um, and hence the idea here is to be working as closely as we can with the, the communities to make sure that this is, this is done in the right way. And that includes the, the guidance of, of, um, of elders who are working with our, our, our repatriation committee of the university here um, to help us understand the necessary protocols uh, to do this in the right way. So um, I think that, uh, I think that as we move on, we're just, we're just passing around three o'clock here, uh, and I do want to make sure that there's an opportunity to ask any, any questions you may have of, of Jessica. Uh, and so I'm going to do that now and see just in terms of the SICC's programs, uh, that great conference that you had, you, you have shared with us a little bit of what came out of it. Um, but I'm wondering if anybody has any feedback or comments for, for Jessica before she leaves. A specific one I have uh, would be, um, this is something that we would address a little bit later on, is that um, what capacity do you see in a real sense for um, partnerships with institutions like our universities and, uh, and institutions like the Cultural Center to actually um, work together to achieve the goal of repatriation? Hmm. What, what capacity? Um, well, we're, what I could see down the road is um, 
I believe that we are a voice for many knowledge keepers, elders, communities, First Nations leaders. Um, they come, they come to us with issues they have with, and and needing needing those partnerships to be built for that rep, that Indigenous voice that that Indigenous representation on different levels, mm -hmm. like you know federal, uh, provincial. Um, the city of Saskatoon, we've partnered with them on um, building Indigenous relations no knowledge and um, terminology, and so that we can understand that un understand that relationship, that reconciliation relationship, and then that is just this, that is just the step one, is that guidebook with the city of Saskatoon, and that's the step one of just understanding our languages, uh, where we our history getting to know our people, our families, our kinship systems, our structures, the ways that we think and the ways that we do things, and um, how we also, um, how we also operate in, in, in terms of um, protecting, protecting that sacred. And that's what it all boils down to, is um, protecting that sacred energy and that, um, so that we can continue to heal together. Um, so those, I think with the partnerships with SICC, we've, we've developed through, for cultural preservation, we've developed a, f uh, a few partnerships with um, institutions through MOUs. So those MOUs dis are designed to, it's like a marriage, <laughs> a marriage license. We, we're, we're in this for the long haul, you know, <laughs> like through thick and thin, we're gonna get, we're gonna work together um, we're going to make sure, and one of the biggest MOUs that we have is with the ITEP program here in, at the U of S, and that in, 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 in working with them on developing and strengthening their um, Indigenous knowledge in their, their educational program, and also giving their students um, a lot of experience in the communities with culture camps and language revitalization um, experiences. So that's just a start, and there's some ideas there. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question yes. a bit. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think, um, I mean, all of us here work in communities, but when we start looking at inst institutional relationships, uh, sometimes things can go quite awry and we're not engaging in the same conversations anymore. And there are, uh, you know, in institutions of all kinds have so many different restrictions in terms of how they can engage with each other. And I think the idea here, of course, is that we make sure we're having that conversation about how can we, how can we partner together um, to, to bring together your knowledge and experience with our knowledge and experience to, to, to move forward the idea of repatriation. So um, I know you have to leave. I want to thank yeah. you very much for, for joining us. Uh, so please join me in, in, in thanking Jessica. I want, I want to teach everyone a, a Nakoda word. So it's, it's actually a Nakoda word that's used with our collections committee, and they work with us on um, helping us with repatriation. And the, so I'll say it, and then I'll give you guys a chance to say it as well. And you keep it in your heart, and you remember what we, why we're doing what we're doing and why we need to continue to be friends and keep working, f wa uh, walking forward in friendship um, in spirit of the treaties, right? Um, it's midu, mida guyabi. So if we could go ahead and say it. Mida guyabi. Mida guyabi. It's a Nakoda word or Sinaboin that's for all my relations. And we take care of our ancestors and they'll take care of us. So me da guyabi. And the reason why you say me, because guyabi is sort of like ancestors, you say me because me and the, how I was taught when I was a kid from my Nakota great bloodline with my great grandmothers is me is a word of saying that is, you put it in front of um, another word to say how special that person is, how special that spirit and that soul is. So you would say, me, me kunsi, or my grandmother. And that when you hear someone say kunsi, it's okay, there's a grandmother. If they say me kunsi, that is an in term of, in, and that's how special they are, that's how loved they are, that's how much I take care of my grandmother, that's how much my, 
my grandmother loves me and um, and how much that um, how special and important and stingy we are and how much how much love grows with that relationship so me daguyabi is how special and important our ancestors are because we all we we share this land right so me daguyabi you guys learned a word today in Nakoda and um, if anybody has any questions after or anything pops up just um, call SICC I'm always at work <laughs> <laughs> Bye. thank you very much Jim, just before you continue, I just want to thank, thank you for your, your moment, asking us to take a moment. Um, it's really easy on a panel like this to forget when you're actually, when we're actually doing the work, and it's very different. It really is, it's, it's very heavy work, and it's really um, heavy lifting on the parts of communities. And we also find it for the people that work in the museums, it's heavy work. And um, so I just want to let you know that in our institution, we've been gifted with some protocols and ways of looking after uh, staff members if they are still feeling, uh, because most people take the day off, the day after a return off work and have ways of cleansing themselves to make themselves feel a, l a little lighter and to, relief and to get the relief. So thank you for your moment. Super. Uh, one question I have or what I'd like to raise for the panel um, would be um, the issue of the different kinds of materials that we typically find housed in, in museums and universities uh, and if the issues are different. So for instance, if you have an item that um, uh, clearly is documented having been um, removed from a, a, a specific community or a specific family 50 years ago, uh, versus uh, an archaeological excavation where you may be looking at uh, a site that is 1,500 years old. Um, are, are, there, are there different issues of repatriation? When we talk about repatriation, are, are we even entertaining um, some of that older archaeological material, or are we focusing primarily on sort of 20th century acquisitions? Or I can start, uh, I feel like. Um, do you have something? No, go ahead. First. So um, I think the more documentation you have, the easier it is. And, and so if it's in memory, if people can remember it, um, it's just, it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, I can't give specifics on um, some of these examples because of uh, confidence. But um, there was certainly one case where we had been um, at the museum, we always had elders in and community members from across the country, and the collections were open. They could come and look at the material from their communities. And one woman came in, um, and, um, and she saw a blanket and said that it was her grandfather's. And there was a million other things there, and this was just a wool blanket. It wasn't that exciting, but she was drawn to it. And... Um, we said, well, maybe, I don't know, um, probably not. Uh, and so we actually looked in our files and found out that um, it was collected from an abandoned, abandoned cabin um, in the 50s. And so her story was that her, her grandfather was um, hunting and, and he came back and his cabin had been looted. And, um, and so we kind of went, oh. Uh, and then she actually found a picture with her grandfather and the blanket, and we immediately said, okay, you're absolutely right. <laughs> this is yours. It can go back with you right now. And so um, things like that are just, they're no-brainers. They obviously have to go back. And as you get older in time, um, it becomes more, um, it's not always this clear cut on who it should go to. Can I raise a yeah. point of, so, <laughs> I hear what Terry's saying, but fundamentally I have an issue with it. And here's my issue. Who are we, a, a colonial institution, to be saying to indigenous communities that we're a better caretaker for that heritage than they are? So, um, and I'm sure Terry doesn't actually necessarily disagree with me on that, it, but, um, but I wanna bring that point forward 
that sometimes when we hear arguments that are put forward by people that are saying, well, it's harder to do this than that, it's like, why is it harder? What is it that you're not willing to give up? And we all have these moments where we find ourselves trapped in the way that we were trained. I mean, I had one I was working on an archaeological uh, exhibit uh, with the Musqueam community, and they were drawing on collections that were in three different institutions, some of which were at our institution. And uh, we were looking at who was going to put which object on display in which community, in which institution. And Musqueam came up with their list, and we came up with our list. And they had picked some things from the collection that was at ours. And my first response was, well, wait a second. Th those things are here. And then I'm like, wait a, wait a second. That's crazy. We don't have a right to say which should be in what institution. So we all catch ourselves. And it's, it's taking that time to go, what am I saying? What does that actually mean? So I would say that with the older materials, if we were to take um, a group of nations working together and saying, we need to take care of the things that are from our territories. We've been here for the longest period of time. We've been here forever. And yes, there are different groups that have come in and come out, but we are a better caretaker of this than you are. That I think we need to be thinking about that as well. Uh, that's an excellent point. And, um, and it's something you mentioned yesterday is um, we're operating in the system where our policies on repatriation uh, have been created from one side. The government or the university or the museum has written them, and so we're just saying, you know, following the orders blindly. Um, but moving forward, um, it's more likely and, and more beneficial to actually co-develop policies that respect these and give those communities equal say in how the policy policies should be, and so maybe that's not an issue. Maybe mm -hmm. that's much less of an issue um, that communally it's agreed that remains can go back, objects can go back, um, and, and it's not so one-sided, right. that it's a, a real um, conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, just to give one quick example before, sorry, honey. Um, we had a return we were doing to a community, and they, um, it's an area that the railway went through, and they said, um, this particular individual uh, is, was found very close to one of the railways. And they said, um, can you tell us whether this is a Chinese railway worker or one of our community members? And we're like, There's a, all we have from this person is one tiny little fragment of one bone. There's nothing that we can do that can tell us whether this person was of Chinese ancestry or was from your family. And the community went back and they thought about it and they came back and they said, no, the person was put to rest in our territory. We will take care of that person and bring that person back to where they were laid to rest. So, yeah. As a relatively new um, newcomer to the repatriation circle, uh, I'm glad you guys talked a lot, so I have a lot to respond to, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of everything that you guys have been saying, like I totally agree that there are changes to be made. So as you guys were talking about policy, I've been looking out on my peers. Some of you are making faces at me, and I'm keeping it very straight-faced. But um, I see a lot of change makers in front of me, and I know who you are. And I know all the things that you're passionate about, whether or not it's pottery or forensics or rock art, it depends on what you are. So we're having this conversation not just to beef up our, our wonderful skills of talking in front of people, but instead we're having these conversations to spark something in you. So policies do need to change. Uh, in terms of what we're saying about communication with communities, have those conversations. Uh, we do our best learning when we're outside of our comfort zone. So get uncomfortable. A lot of the time when we're talking about repatriation, the reason so many communities are very passionate about more recent stuff is because they can identify with it. Further back, it's a little bit harder, but some of the problems that we face, personally from the indigenous perspective side, is we've had many bumps and bruises in this road, and a lot of the stories have been lost. So we're trying to reconnect and refind ourselves through learning the language, through archaeology, or through repatriation. So when we talk about repatriation, it's not just always a bad thing. I think of it as hope. And 
And if there's something you can do today to either communicate more with the communities in your area or to learn a little bit more about the past that you work in, that's kind of going to work as well. Um, but in terms of problems and step forwards, I think we have a wonderful opportunity together to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I'm mindful of the time and I want to make sure there's a chance for questions, but I want to throw one more, <coughs> one more thing at the panel here. Okay, and this is a statement and I would like you to respond to this, please. Okay. Don't cheat. <laughs> I can't read his hand. <laughs> Museums are colonial institutions that can never properly do justice and honor the dynamic nature of culture, so shut them down. Ah. Please respond. Okay. Can I cheat and get something out of my backpack? Sure. I have a response, but everybody else okay. should go first. <clears throat> in, the, in the meantime, you, either of you would like to? Take it away. Yikes. <laughs> um, I disagree. I think museums do have a place. Um, I think the biggest, one of the biggest issues uh, that I've talked about in, in previous talks uh, is capacity. And um, not every nation is ready to take everything back. Uh, they don't have staff, they don't have facilities, they have other issues. They're worried uh, about basic housing needs or um, water or, or whatever it is. And so uh, I think repatriation is, is a long-term process and we're in the era of reconciliation and repatriation this is going to define our lives and maybe in 50 or 100 years we'll be at that point where we don't have to have national or provincial institutions that everything can be devolved to communities but i think now we're not there and i think that they have a fundamental value in education in um, uh, another key aspect of reconciliation is education, is letting people know indigenous stories, indigenous histories, um, the trauma that has been experienced. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that that aspect uh, has to be kept up for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Um, so for those who don't know me, hello. My name is Honey, I work for Wanuskewin Heritage Park, which is an institution in its own right. Uh, we do tours, we do exhibits, we have a lot of different things, and I really love Wanuskewin, not as an outsider or someone who works for the park, but as an individual of this community. Uh, I can tell you a little story. When I was in grade one, I remember going to Wanuskewin for the first time, not really knowing what it means to be Indigenous. I knew I was Indigenous, but I didn't know what it meant. And then I remember walking into the theater before they destroyed that and rebuilt beautifully. And I remember looking up on the stage and seeing a men's fancy, sh uh, fancy dancer. And his regalia is full yellow, and he's dancing, and it just looked amazing. And in that moment, I realized, wow, is this my culture? And I had a sense of pride. That moment for me was really, really important, especially as a young Indigenous little girl, learning and seeing my, my culture in a good way living, not just plastered behind a glass, but... So when I work at Wanuskewin, we strive to do living reminders of the sacred relationship to the land, to the evolving cultures of the Northern Plains people. Like, when we talk about um, the role institutions play, I think we, we have a lot of learning yet to do in most places. But as long as we're being authentic to the culture, giving the communities a voice, hiring those voices in the community is going to be something very important. But always, always, always consulting, informed consent, constant communication. It's like you knew this question was coming. Well, <laughs> it was just, it's just a really interesting question. And I would um, also refer to the murdering, murder, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls calls to actions. Uh, because in that, they said education is key and critical and non-indigenous peoples need to become informed and educated. And museums that have self-representation by indigenous communities are one way to help to spread the message. But, so I think, Yes, museums have a, have a role to, to play in the future. Museums have been changing and need to continue to change. Um, 
So I wanted to, um, in January of 2018, a number of museum professionals were asked to put forward their New Year's resolutions for museums. So with your indulgence, I'm going to read a really well-argued piece by Anthony Romero. He said, recall that your institution is not part of some distant colonial past, but remains part of the ongoing project of colonial domination and that your function as a bastion of cultural legitimacy and valuation is predicated not only on your participation in the enduring colonial project of displacement and erasure, but those of capitalism, heteropatriarchy, ableism, and white supremacy as well. Do not be defeated by this fact. Being a part of a history does not necessarily lock you into any one particular future. Your capacity to dream and to act on those dreams is all that prevents you from developing a better institution. Museums have always been about the care of property, material, and intellectual culture, but what if your institution were to break from this tradition? What if your institution committed itself to building social relations over property relations? This is no easy task. Colonialism imported much of what lies at the core of your institution, including the twin ideas of property and ownership. Museums have always been about the care of property. What if you're, um, remember that, your institu that you are not your institution. An institution is not an organism, but an instrument, a tool. It may be a bloodied tool, but remember there are no clean tools, only those that still serve a purpose and those that don't. Just because a tool was invented with one purpose in mind does not mean it cannot be repurposed and work just as well or better. So I think Anthony said it brilliantly. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you very much. So as you can see, they can handle the tough stuff. Uh, and, and this is a complex issue. There's no question about it. Um, and we've heard some really interesting ideas from our three remaining panels and Jessica before she left. So we want to give you an opportunity to raise any issues or ask any questions of the panelists. I'll remind you that we are making a video of this that we're going to post it so that others can uh, can uh, join in the conversation. Um, we have a microphone at the back, so I would appreciate it in this part of the session if you would use the microphone. If there's a reason why you would like to ask a question but you don't want to be part of the, of the video, then please just uh, refrain. Uh, and at the end, uh, we'll make sure there's a few minutes we'll, we'll get, get the the, uh, our, um, our crew at the back to, uh, to hit the off button and give you the opportunity to ask a, a question uh, at, at that time, so okay. But uh, for the time being then, um, we're gonna open up for questions and or comments. And you can throw things at them and see what they think. See what sticks. Yeah. <laughs> They're a tough crew, they can handle it. The idea is to, Work them out of a job. <laughs> Clint Westman, what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We'll get the ball rolling here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for this really stimulating discussion. I guess my question is, is it, uh, I'm not going to word this properly because I'm thinking it as I'm asking it, but you know, increasingly museums are also producing curated material that's online. Um, digital collections are pro propping up, popping up all over the place. I myself am involved in a, in a digital archive, cultural archive, in, where I do my field work in, in East Timor. And I'm just wondering, you know, just your thoughts on how, how do we build those good relationships when we're developing this sort of projects? Oftentimes we go by instinct and by the relations that we have on the ground, but we can't control how things are used beyond the sphere that, you know, that we can control in the immediacy. Uh, I can take a crack at it first. Um, so, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of, um, as soon as sort of uh, 3D technology came around, photogrammetry, uh, museums were terrified of it. Um, 
they um, were really worried about their models getting out of all sorts of stuff, um, you know, Venus de Milo and, and all of these other things, um, <clears throat> because I think they thought that people would then copy them and make keychains and somehow they'd be out of money. They'd, they'd put the gift shops out of business. Um, but some of the bigger museums have uh, taken the step to actually put some of their models online. And so the Smithsonian is the principal example. There's many others that have done this. Uh, I think they've realized that um, the technology is not there, that the model is not going to be as good as the original, that it will allow people to engage with the material and the history and the objects in different ways, and they haven't shied away from it. Um, my concern is for sacred objects. On the Northwest Coast, um, to carve something, um, you need to own the privilege to do so. Crests are owned. Uh, and so just putting pictures of them out there for other people to copy is probably more problematic. Uh, and Sue can probably talk to this, but uh, I think we want to um, encourage a new generation of indigenous artists to play with the mediums, but uh, at the same time, we have to respect that uh, some of these are owned and, and that they're not appropriate to, to be used that way. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I was involved in the development of something called the Reciprocal Research Network, which brings together Northwest Coast collections currently from 28 different institutions around the world. And one of the ways that we dealt with this was the project was co-developed. So the Amista Cultural Society in Musqueam, Stalo, and uh, the Museum of Anthropology worked together to create the Reciprocal Research Network. So all the policies, procedures, and ways to behave and act. Um, and in order to uh, it's free, but you need to become a member and join, and therefore you have um, accepted certain terms and responsibilities. One of the really interesting things, though, that came out of that project, which was the core of it to begin with, was 12 institutions the co and the co-developers coming together to create this network, um, was at the end of the project, after four years, five years of working together and being ready to launch, one of the questions that came up was the issue of culturally sensitive materials. For us. So, um, and uh, it was, so is the Reciprocal Research Network a gatekeeper? Is there somebody on staff who determines whether an institution has put something up that's culturally sensitive or not? And the communities and the community liaisons that we've been working with and the elders all came back and said, no, that's not your role. Your role is to bring in the materials, have the materials on display, and for us to be able to respond to those institutions and to educate them. So it's not really an answer to your question, but it shows that there's, there's a lot of thought that people are putting into exactly these kinds of um, issues of the digital world. Yeah. I think in terms of um, building that relationship more, too, um, Oh, again, I'll always harp communication with your group that you're working with. But uh, something that I've been thinking about a lot more is, is there a way that we can create um, almost partners? So for example, kind of train them about what we're doing and how, what our plans are, um, and kind of share with them in layman's terms. We don't have the right or, um, what is the word I'm trying to say? We don't have the authority to educate them like using cultural materials. Why don't we bring the down our layman's, our terms down a their way, so that way we're not raise, making them raise to our level, but we're actually on an even field. And if you notice right now, we're actually in a circle. So in a circle, there's no top, there's no bottom, there's no beginning and no end. Part of ways of knowing is in a circle, we're all equal. So when we enter into these conversations, no one's better than the other. So this, when we talk about power, for example, you're presentation yesterday, there's no power anywhere because at any given time, we both hold the same amount of power. So when you're building these relationships, um, the elders, the community, there's, their stories should be the ones that we resort to. We should not be outside objectors, I guess you can say. So I hope I answered that. Yeah? Cool. I just wondered, going off that piece that you read that I found very inspiring and relevant, um, if each of you have an example from your work or your own dreaming about 
how museums or the work of archaeologists can connect between um, that historical record and artifacts and communities and communication. So either something that you've actually done that worked well or a dream that you would have. <laughs> Maybe Jim, maybe Jim should go Jim, first. You know, yeah. <laughs> 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 Ma'am, I'm the guy who says shut him down. I guess I'll take the first crack. Sure. Yeah, sure, okay. You're doing great. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys know, but I dream a lot. Dr. Walker knows this. Um, but in terms of what I would like, um, so if you don't know what my project is, I'm doing uh, curriculum development, so, well not curriculum, but program development at Wanuskewin, so creating an archaeological program for kids to learn. And my dream big, maybe not in my masters, because that's not going to take two years, but dream big, maybe at the end of the year, no, no, end of my life, not the end of the year, don't quote <laughs> me on that, but the end of my life, I hope to make an impact, like a positive impact on the communities to help other Indigenous youth, other Indigenous adults, communities, to learn and reconnect their culture like I have through archaeology. Like I'm very, very grateful to be here, to be on the panel, even though um, I'm not as skilled or has as much experience, but I feel like I'm very grateful to be sitting amongst you guys. But my dream big cloud in the sky would be to kind of create like a program or um, kind of like a roving activity for kids to even interact with archaeology, but not just archaeology in the hard science, but everything that we do. So you can be looking at art for one moment, stories another, you can be a storyteller, learning about the past, learning about what happened specifically here, and then being proud of that and sharing that. I hope that answers your question. Who's starting? Uh, okay, I will talk about an example from uh, my work that um, I'm very proud of. Um, this is the, the, my excavations at Quentin Macaulay, the Leader Cemetery, and, and the burials that we recovered there. Um, these are obviously a very sensitive issue, and we worked with the community um, from start to finish. Um, once we realized that we had something remarkable, um, the most bead-rich burials uh, anywhere in North America for any time period, we realized, um, you know, there's something special. And um, the community really drove the idea that they wanted to tell this story more broadly. And so we spent a number of years working with the Canadian Museum of History and also the Temswea Museum in Seashelt um, to develop a display uh, about those people and um, showing that display to the community members, to the elders, uh, to good friends. Um, it was very emotional, the sense of pride that they have um, knowing that uh, at the Canadian Museum of History, about a million people a year will see that, and they'll know Shishal is on the map, they'll know about Coast Salish culture, um, they'll be elevated. Um, people from around the world know Haida, uh, of course, they don't know as much about the Coast Salish people, and they certainly don't know anything about Shishal. And so uh, they wanted to be on the map, and, um, and so working with them to create something that they could be so proud in of uh, made me very proud to, to work on that project. Yeah, thanks. I'll also talk about um, an example, and I guess I would phrase it in what I aspire to do is to help people achieve what they want to do and what they need to do for who they are. Um, the last exhibit that I worked on was called The Fabric of Our Land, Salish Weaving. Uh, the Salish people have been making the most incredible weavings for a very long time out of mountain goat and domesticated dog. Uh, these early, the earliest blankets are nowhere close to the Salish, contemporary Salish communities on the west coast of British Columbia. They're in Europe and the east coast of North America. And a community member came forward and said, Sue, this is Wendy Grant John from Musqueam, Musqueam ex-chief and counselor. She said, Sue, I used to really hate museums. I now sort of respect what museums do. Repatriation is a long-term goal of ours. But you're a museum. You can bring those, you could bring those weavings back 
tomorrow, bring those weavings back into an exhibit for us. And that's what we did. We were able to bring back weavings from that had not been home, to be there when they were opened, when people reconnected with them, to arrange workshops where weavers could come in and handle them and learn from the hands of their own ancestors. Uh, so we brought back weavings for, that were in uh, um, Finland, in Scotland, uh, in the United States, all back to Vancouver and created an exhibit from that with indigenous, full of indigenous voice. So those, that's what I dream about and aspire to do. So, thanks. I had a feeling that Jim wanted me to ask a question. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my question pertains more to uh, interpretation than to repatriation of objects. And you know, possibly also has implications for intangible heritage as well as, as tangible heritage. So, you know, things like stories. I'm just wondering if you've seen, or what types of shifts in interpretation practices have you seen over the last couple of decades as people try to grapple with some of these issues and bring principles of reconciliation into interpretation? You know, I know with Australian materials there's a convention of warning people if there's photos or names of deceased individuals. And I'm wondering if you've seen anything like that in Canada, or is, are there practices we need to incorporate? Not just universe, or, uh, museums, but also things like parks or other agencies that are communicating around indigenous issues. Okay, so go first. And so, okay. uh, yeah, I think we've seen huge changes in um, interpretation. I think that there needs to be um, even larger uh, changes in interpretation. I um, always, wherever I go anywhere, I always look at all the labels as I'm walking along the streets um, to see if they have indigenous language on them, to see whose stories are being told, to see what voice they're being told. And I would echo uh, what Honey was saying, that it's all of our responsibilities when we see things that aren't done in that kind of a way to start asking who's, who's doing that and why are they doing it in that way. There are other ways to do it. And we're seeing this change. I mean, I'm thinking about a garden that I know in Vancouver where all their signage now has the Hunkaminum names for plants that have Hunkaminum names. They have indigenous histories and stories on the labels, right? So people are beginning to make those changes. We're seeing that happening. We're seeing the interpretation of the public as to how they view heritage and material culture in a different way. So uh, those of us that work in museums, one of the things we get every day are emails from people. What is this? I found this. What is it? But more and more, we're getting the question, what is this, and how can I return it to the rightful owners? Which is a dramatic change that we're seeing, and that suggests that some of the ways and different of doing things differently are getting out there, and that the public is resonating with those and thinking through what that means and wanting to see things go home. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I can't remember the question. <laughs> it was about interpretation. Oh, interpretation, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, I did have something to add. Uh, I think language is a, a huge, um, big deal. Uh, and I think that at, the, at MOA and at the Thamesway Museum, um, that usually the first language that you see on signs um, is indigenous. Uh, and so in Seashell, it, it's Shashi Shotlam, uh, and then the English is subtitled underneath. Um, I think that that goes a long way for people, visitors from around the world that come in and see, okay, um, I'm English and I'm a visitor here. I get a subtitle, uh, and the people that live here uh, get uh, top billing. Um. So you asked my favorite question ever. I'm an interpreter. Um, but in terms of interpretation, like I've only, I've worked at many different places. So I've worked at Fort Carlton, I've worked at Wanuskewa, and I've worked uh, almost for parks for a brief period of time. So I've seen different institutions and how they do different interpretations. Um, and my sister is a Parks Canada interpreter too, so I hear her perspective and the challenges that we all go through. But in terms of interpretation, it's getting way better. So I'm thinking of, if you've ever been out to Wanuskewin, we do something called TP teachings. And these are the teachings of the Plains Cree uh, teepee, how each pole has a value, how each 
Uh, everything that we do has meaning. And we have been gifted that, those teachings so we can share with others. And with that gift, we have entered into a verbal agreement with Mary Lee, our elder. And part of it is, if we're female, we should be wearing skirts because it's part of protocol. We should be honoring every part of that agreement as much as possible. So when we do our work at Wanuskewin, we've been doing it for years now and years. Um, when we talk about reconciliation, I feel like we've been on that track for quite a bit of time. So we've been interpreting from the voices from our communities, and we want to make we are guided by our own um, board of elders. So as whatever decision we make, whatever we're interpreting, they always make sure that we are doing it in the right way. We're not being predatory. We're not. Um, mislabeling or doing anything like that and we're bringing back permanent exhibits and we are listing it in six different cultural uh, languages so there's going to be Cree, Dene, Michif, all of these wonderful languages going to be listed including English so we're being true to the people that were at the park or who could have been at the park and even with syllabics being around the world even on Taylor's um, sweater if you've seen our logo for the department, it has syllabics. And um, even though you don't know what the shapes look like or what they say, I do. And when you misspell them, I notice. <laughs> so when we talk about language, I'm reconnecting to my language. My first language that I le technically learned was French. So when I'm reconnecting to my own culture, I want to learn syllabics. I want, I want to learn Cree. I want to learn how to spell it. So seeing these things, even on campus, is a big breakthrough for all of us because it allows us to reconnect, to take back something that had been either taken away or forcibly, forcibly taken away. So I'm very thankful that we're able to step so forward with interpretation across, but then even going even further and doing interpretations in those languages would be amazing mm -hmm. if we could get those language speakers. We have time for one question, quick one. I'll make it quick. <laughs> um, in terms of artifacts that require extremes amount, extreme amount of preservation and the communities have requested them back, how do you handle that? Are you, do you just, does the museum have specific protocols or do they require the communities to have certain facilities or do you just give it back because the community wants to do with it as they please? Oh, so I'll I'll yeah, yeah, take yeah, the yeah. first kick at the can, so to speak, on that. Um, so anybody who wants to read about preservation, I can really strongly recommend Miriam Clavier's book, Preserving What We Value, um, because that's one of the first books that looked at different ways of preserving and what it means for different cultures to preserve. When we're talking at the Museum of Anthropology and uh, the U University of British Columbia, um, repatriation is the return of everything to do with the piece. So if the community took that, because the determination is that that belonging be belongs back with the community, that we should not have it, we should never have had it. So it goes back, and if the community determines that that belonging needs to be burned, that belonging needs to be worn and used in ceremony, that's entirely up to the community. That's not anything to do with, uh, with us. So. Yeah, I, I agree um, that um, once it's determined that the community, it's, it's theirs and they can do what they want with it. Whatever is culturally appropriate, it's not our say anymore. Last word? Hmm. That's my last word. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no. hmm. Uh, hmm. In terms of, I guess it also depends on like the context or the situation. So if they want to take it home and it does need a lot of preservation, maybe that's our role is aid them in that preservation, mm -hmm. make sure that they take the best care of it. And if they need extra resources, we can be there for them. Thank you. Yeah. They already turned it back on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to uh, extend a special thanks to the College of Arts and Science for um, providing some, uh, some of the funding uh, that was necessary to bring uh, Dr. Rowley to the campus and to put on the event yesterday and today, particularly the Role Model Speaker Fund. Uh, shout out to 
Dr. Dirk DeBoer here, the Acting Vice Dean Indigenous, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Dirk. You've been a great ally of, of our, our lecture series and our program, and we appreciate you know, all the hard work you've put in in that office. Um, uh, Candace has had to go back to work, but I want to say very much uh, how, how uh, we, as a department, appreciate her support of our activities and the way in which she f uh, facilitates um, the work that we do in the department, but also when we have these special events here. So thank you very much uh, to Candace. Uh, and of course, our panelists, uh, Jessica had to leave, as we know, um, but uh, uh, still with us, we have Honey um, and Sue and Terry, but especially to, to Sue for coming all this way, and well, we're trying to convince her that this is typical midwinter weather in Saskatoon, and the rest of that, <laughs> the rest of that is a myth. So, um, Sue, we do have a, a small gift for you. Thank you so um, much. To show our appreciation for you spending the time and, and sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Thank you all for coming, and uh, look forward to more events in our, in our series on archaeology and anthropology in an era of engagement and reconciliation. Thank you all.